happen. Okay. So, um, so again, starting over, this is Gil Price, Executive Director of Condominium Law Group. I have two of my attorney colleagues of our firm, Valerie Oman and Ken Hare. And we're going to have, um, everyone is muted at the moment. So the way the Zoom conference works, if you didn't join us last week, if you scroll down to the bottom of your screen, you should pass bar. It starts with mute, stop video, invite, manage participants. Chat is the one you're going to want to focus on. If you click on chat, hopefully you saw the message that I sent to people that were waiting in the waiting room uh, this morning. Um, but if you have a question, uh, I'm going to moderate our Zoom conference. So just go ahead and use the chat feature. Again, if you don't see that taskbar at the bottom of the screen or the box that you're looking at on your computer, scroll down and it will appear. Um, use chat. You can send it to everyone and I'll be, or you can send it to me. Uh, and we're going to be monitoring those questions as we go through our Zoom conference. Uh, if you see me drinking anything, it's just tea, people. Just Earl Grey tea with some honey. So hey, no judgment. No judgment. <laughs> no judgment. No judgment. Okay. So we're going to jump into this. So we've got a question um, from one of our manager uh, colleague uh, friends, and we also have some board members that I think are going to be joining us this morning. So the first question uh, for Ken and Valerie: uh, Can a homeowner request? Uh, can can a homeowner request a forbearance on their HOA dues? Uh, if they if they can if they do can they incur <coughs> a financial hardship with no proof required, like a layoff letter from their employer? Okay, Gil, I had a little bit of a tough time hearing you, so I'm guessing maybe other people <coughs> did too. Could you just quickly repeat the question? I, I sure, think he, it was deferral is the word, right? They want to yeah, defer can, their homeowner payments. Can yeah. homeowner request a forbearance on, I'm reading it. Forbearance, forbearance, okay. Forbearance on their HOA dues. If they do, can they assert a financial hardship with no proof required, such as a layoff letter from their employer? Okay. So, the you know, people can ask for whatever they want to ask for, and that's no more or less true now than it always has been. Um, and I think part of the question, though, is how an association should handle those types of requests. What we're telling people in general right now is that their default should be to um, administer and stick to their collection policy in the same way that they always have, but that they should also be responsive to homeowner hardship requests as a result of this um, pandemic and the, the shutdown that we're all experiencing. So um, the language of forbearance, deferral, those really don't have um, any particular meaning in the context of homeowners assessments. Those are really more like student loan or even mortgage uh, type term terms. Um, but if you have a homeowner that comes to you and, and they say that they've lost their job as a result of the COVID-19 situation and they're asking for a payment plan, uh, we think that it's very reasonable and we encourage our clients to work with those homeowners to the extent that you can. Um, but of course, the key is that you, you need to be dealing with a homeowner who's being proactive, who's come to you with this request, and who has some sort of plan in place um, or proposal for how they can actually pay. So um, forbearance uh, in lo loan terminology essentially means a period of time during which you don't make any payments at all. Um, and I think that we would advise our clients to be careful about um, a, a time period with zero payments, just because what that does is it results in the debt growing pretty quickly, which isn't good for either the association or for the homeowner. Um, and I think it all depends on the context and the specifics of the circumstances you're dealing with. So if it's a homeowner who's always paid responsibly, has a really good history of um, paying as agreed, or as they are supposed to, doesn't have a long history of repeated delinquencies, um, and they actually come to you, they're proactive, they have a plan, and they're asking for, you know, 60 days to, to not pay, but they have a, a proactive payment plan proposal following that 60 days. You know, my answer on that type of situation would be different than somebody who says, I can't make any payments, I lost my job, I don't know when I'm going to be able to pay. Please just, you know, don't do anything for six months. Um, so I think those I've are got... two, very, two very different situations. So I have got two Two comments also. Whether or not you can require proof, my recommendation would be don't require proof 
because the bill which the government just passed for mortgages, even though it doesn't apply, does not require anything more to get loan forbearance than a statement by the, uh, the borrower that they have a financial upset because of COVID-19. So the standard for proof has been set really, really low by the, the federal government. And I think that uh, if an owner comes to you as a board or a manager and says, I lost my job, you have to just accept that as true. Uh, you can ask them to, to do a, a written statement that says that they have lost their job and that's about all I think you can do. Uh, the second comment I'd give is that uh, National CAI issued earlier this week a, a guidance regarding foreclosures by HOAs for their communities. And their guidance was that uh, no foreclosures be started or pursued until the end of this crisis. Uh, but they did start, their first guideline is that you deal with owners who come to the board or the manager and say, I am you know, distressed financially and I need a plan. And so, <clears throat> I think that covers it, unless you have anything else, uh, Valerie. No, and I think that's the primary distinction that we've tried to make, you know, in talking about this previously with people that had the same question is, you know, your answer is very different if you've got an owner who's being proactive and communicating with you versus an owner that simply stops paying and doesn't communicate. Any other questions, Gil, that came in in advance? No, not at this time. And I'm monitoring our group <clears throat> chat. I'm just going to interject here again. So for those of you who have joined us a little after uh, 10 this morning, if you go down to the bottom of your screen, uh, does everyone see the task bar where you've got mute, stop video? What you wanna do is click the chat icon and then you can look over to your right hand side and you'll be able to send a message to everyone or to me or to other people that you see uh, that is on this Zoom conference. Does everyone okay, see then. that bottom task bar and you see the chat option down below? Okay. So the, the other things which I think might be helpful to the group and might get some more questions. One is that our court systems are not operating in any normal fashion. And so the, and not only have there been things like, uh, you know, mandates that say we can't do evictions, we can't do foreclosures, the courts are basically shut down. The legal processing servers are shut down. And so to start a new lawsuit, whether it's for collections or to try and enforce some kind of uh, compliance with the declaration right now is pretty much a, uh, an unviable option. And <clears throat> normally we would say to clients that if you've got, you know, noise complaints between two neighbors, you can just tell them that the you know, the individual neighbors have the right to go to court as well to enforce the declaration, but they won't have any better luck with the court system than the HOA would right now. So <clears throat> one of the tools which we normally have for enforcement and one of the tools we have for deferring neighbor disputes back to the neighbors is gone. And it's just something to be aware of. The, if you have a lawsuit already in place, some of the routine procedural issues can still be conducted. So at least this week, they're still conducting scheduled summary judgment hearings and scheduled motions before the court. <clears throat> but even that might come to an end if they continue to lock down or if the judges start to stay home instead of coming into the courthouse themselves. Okay, um, we have a... <clears throat> Sorry, Ken, we do have a question coming in from our audience this morning. The question is, what should we do about the construction project that was in process when Governor Inslee prohibited non-essential construction? So that's an excellent question, and I've dealt with it four times this week so far. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> the governor issued two days after his initial order a clarification about what construction projects were considered essential. And what I think it comes down to is that most construction projects were declared not essential. And the exception which I had one client convinced me was valid this week is where an, the, uh, 
architect of record on the, the project, which is a reclad project, declared that the physical condition of the building was so poor that they had to continue replacing the structural plywood and putting the fireproofing back up on the building, or they were going to create a life safety issue for the homeowners who were still living in the community. And so that's a reasonable standard. If you have a professional like an architect or engineer who's willing to put their professional uh, opinion in writing and say that the work is necessary to protect life and limb, and this is immediate life and limb, it's not a, well, if the roof doesn't get replaced, it'll start leaking next year kind of an evaluation. But if you can get the architect to declare the work is actually needed right now because of the risk to the residents, I think you can continue the project. But I think that most of the, you know, almost every project we've got going, the roofing projects that are in the middle of it, they need to essentially finish the portion they're on to make it watertight and then stand down. Uh, if you're, they're doing strip and reclad on multiple buildings, <clears throat> make the building watertight and then stand down. Uh, landscaping projects, I have a tough time feeling like the architect is going to declare are essential to life and safety. So um, <clears throat> hopefully that answers the question. There is a standard by which you can get someone to do it and it is that of your uh, licensed professional. So a um, follow-up question to that really has to do with landscaping. So, so again, from one of our community association managers, we're hearing mixed news from our association landscapers. Some are saying they're essential, others say they're not. Uh, what advice do you have for the management companies who will undoubtedly get calls where landscaping is not being done? Um, they're also getting calls from owners who are wanted uh, assessments, who want assessments lowered um, because landscape is not being done. And then they're getting complaints about landscapers who are working. So what advice do you have in that situation? Well, I think I've just said that I don't think that uh, the association or the manager can declare that landscape is essential, especially in the short term. Um, I don't think a landscaper can declare for themselves that they are essential because what we're seeing is almost every vendor who wants to continue their income stream declaring themselves essential. Yeah. And <clears throat> I, I understand that because I'm trying to stay in business to keep our clients served as well. And to some extent preserve uh, part of my income stream because I want to be able to pay my employees. Uh, but you're as a manager, you're competing with the interests of your homeowners and if you've got homeowners objecting to the landscapers being on site, I think that you have to defer to protecting their health and welfare and say to the landscaper that they should not be on site. If, the, if your owners are not complaining and the, uh, you know, the city's not coming out and sending your landscaping crew home, then I think you can probably sort of look the other way and let the landscaper work. But, you know, I've got, uh, a couple of the construction contracts I had where the contractor needs to go into the unit to help replace a window. And I have told them if the owner says they do not want someone in their home, that absolutely they should not be putting that vendor in the home, even if the contractor wants to do it. Uh, so I don't think a landscaper can declare themselves essential. I think you could decide a cleaning service was essential to keep the sanitization of your buildings in good shape. So if you wanna keep your, your cleaning service on site, I think you can do that. But I, I think that you're, you should be deferring to telling the landscapers to stay home. And when an owner says that they should have their dues reduced, um, basically the answer is no, you have a budget. The budget was set last year. You're gonna continue that. If there are savings because of reduced landscaping expenses, then they will see that saving at the end of the year, but there may also be increased expenses unrelated to landscaping that offset that savings. Not to mention the possibility of increased um, delinquencies. So most of our associations know that they've 
know and have been budgeting for some amount of delinquency because we tell people to budget for that in their annual budget. But because we've come off of a fairly long period of relative prosperity, the delinquency rates have been much lower than they were, say, 10 years ago. And so associations have been budgeting a much smaller amount for expected delinquencies. So if you're saving money in one area, it might be to the association's benefit um, because it, you might be experiencing an uptick in the delinquencies. And you, so you wanna be you know, creating as much of a cushion as you can. So we have a, uh, another question here from our um, uh, audience this morning. In last week's Zoom conference, it was mentioned creating an amendment template for associations to use to adopt electronic communication process. Is this being explored? Um, I didn't get any feedback after last meeting about clients wanting to do that. I do have a, um, a resolution from the board, which we prepared, um, which can do some of the corrective work for boards to ratify decisions that they've made outside of their standard process. So, Gil, you got that from me, didn't you? Gosh, I've gotten so many emails since last <clears throat> week, last Thursday. Okay, yeah, so you, you there are... It, you sent it to us earlier this week. Yeah, okay. so there's two resolutions. Gil will send them out to his management and uh, homeowner list of uh, email list. So one of them is a resolution that allows the board to adopt some action by unanimous written consent. And the second one is a board resolution that you would do at a meeting where you don't need unanimous written consent. You just would need a quorum for the meeting and a majority of the quorum to approve. But these are remedial uh, resolutions to fix mistakes that don't comply technically with your uh, bylaws or your declaration. Uh, in terms of a declaration amendment, to provide for electronic meetings, electronic notice, et cetera. Um, that's still something that would have to be done for, uh, you know, with a vote of the membership, according to your individual uh, governing documents. If that's something you're interested in, please email me separately and uh, we can give you a, a price on what that might cost and a guide on how long it might take. But it would require a vote of your membership. You can use written consents, which could include emails and faxes and mailed in ballots so that you don't have to actually hold a meeting to do it. Um, and, but it would require the 60 or 67 or whatever the percentage is in your declaration to pass. And then once it's passed, it would need to be recorded. Okay, so we have another question. Uh, if a homeowner is already collections can apply late fees during this time a second question that this individual is asked how about special assessments for roofing if this isn't considered essential can we still continue to collect but not start the work so i mean you know there's two different questions here what can we do and what what should we do right if an if an owner is in collections and um let's say for example you have not yet referred that account to your association's attorney for for a lien and demand and further efforts to collect. Um, you can continue to assess late fees. And as I mentioned earlier, our advice to clients who are asking about how to handle delinquencies right now is that your default should be to follow your collection policy fairly uniformly. That being said, if the owner reaches out and proposes a payment plan or some other voluntary resolution of the balance due and asks for a waiver of the late fees and interest, um, our advice is almost always that our clients should consider doing that. Um, there are exceptions, you know, if you're dealing with somebody who's, you know, we see certain people in, in our office every year or so for 10 years in a row. So, so if somebody is a repeat offender and their, uh, their delinquency is not a result of the COVID situation, I think it might be reasonable to not waive late fees. But I think your default should be when an owner is being proactive and is communicating with you, that you should be willing to waive uh, things like late fees that are not out of pocket to the association. Um, as for a special assessment for roofing or frankly for any other thing, if you have gone through the budget process and adopted a special assessment, I think you should, your default should be to continue collecting it. Um, 
I think that a board could, I suppose, determine that a project is going to be put off if it's most of the associations that we have that are that are planning on replacing the roof, for example, and that are assessing a special assessment in order to pay for that. They are either participating in an association loan that requires them to continue assessing those special assessments and collecting <clears throat> them to make the payments and or they're dealing with a relatively time sensitive project. Most associations don't just go out and decide to replace the roof five years before it needs replacing, right? So the fact that you're in a short construction delay because of the COVID-19 shutdowns does not mean that your project isn't going to happen or that it isn't going to happen, you know, relatively soon, perhaps within the next couple of months. And so uh, I think you would be creating more trouble than, uh, than relief in stopping special assessment payments um, just as a result of the slowdown. That, that being said, if you have an owner who comes to you for their account in general, regardless of whether you're talking about the regular, you know, monthly assessments or annual assessments um, or a special assessment for a project like this, you know, again, our advice would be that you try to work with the owner as much as possible in light of the situation that we're all dealing with. One other comment I would provide is that if someone comes to you and says they've lost their job and can't pay their bills, I think you could remind them that the, the government set up a program to allow them to avoid paying their mortgage payments during this crisis. And that should allow most of the people because of the more generous unemployment benefits which are being provided to pay the rest of their bills, including the HOA. And so part of what you're trying to do is when someone has limited funds, uh, give them a reason to keep the HOA in the list of things that they will continue to pay uh, with their limited funds. Okay. And if so the unemployment's not coming for another week, you know, giving them a week or two delay is fine. If the check is coming from the government in mid-April for $1,200, you could give them until mid-April to pay. Those are very reasonable accommodations to make. But, yeah. you know, the, the, the reality is the government is trying to replace the lost income for all of the people who have lost their job because of COVID-19. And so if the income is replaced, they can pay their HOA dues. So another question we have uh, through our chat is, of, is um, this, if an association ends up not being uh, able to pay its bill due to COVID-19, would the association be able to file an insurance claim for loss of income? So the answer is probably not. Um, as a business owner, I have an income stream which is insured, but it's only insured for very specific losses. And my policy all relate to building losses. If I had a fire, I have uh, loss of income protection for the law firm. But HOAs don't have any kind of loss of income under their standard policy. I'd be really surprised if anyone would sell an HOA, something which would guarantee the assessment stream of income. But if you have a policy that is insuring the assessment stream of income, you certainly want to look at it and see if the income stream is insured for any type of interruption, in which case the pandemic would count, or if it's just insured for losses related to property damage the way that my policy is. So you can contact your insurance agent and they may be able to ask you. Um, my insurance agent's response was they have no idea. Their recommendation to every one of their law firm clients was to go ahead and submit a claim and see what happens. And I think part of the advice too was that submit the claim even though they think we're going to get denied because at some point the denial, if you know, depending on what federal relief becomes available to what types of businesses, small businesses, as a result of the situation, having a denial uh, of a claim for loss of business income might somehow be useful in the future. And I will add that HOAs do not qualify from what I read as a small business under the um, the loan, the SBA loan provision of the new law. Uh, there is a provision for nonprofits, but the nonprofits have to be a 501c3 
and no condo or HOA association is a 501c3. Okay, so we have another question. Uh, can communities prohibit non-residents from entering the building? And then uh, secondly, can boards require advance notice for entry by non-residents, such as contractors, cleaning people, et cetera? So we actually, we, have, we answered this client, this question for, I think, a client um, last <coughs> week. Uh, it wasn't a client, it was a manager that had reached out to ask us this question. And I think essentially our answer was that we don't think an association can completely prohibit it, but that you can put up signs that say it's prohibited. Um, and you can certainly ask your owners to cooperate with the association in reducing or eliminating the number of people that they invite into their homes. Um, it's just the enforcement mechanism that gets to be tricky. We had a client that wanted to post a sign and let the sign be notice of a new fine that was, you know, a, a new rule and a new fine without doing the whole adopt a fine policy, publish it to the owners kind of thing. And I, and I don't think that you can do that. I think you still have to follow the, you know, the correct procedures for fining for breaking a rule. Um, but I think it's difficult to prohibit non-residents uh, because it's essentially changing an owner's right to ha how an owner has the right to use their home. But Ken, you might have additional thoughts on this too, because that was maybe 10 days ago that we did that. Well, I think it's okay to tell all of your owners that they need to stop having any construction work done. I think you might be able to tell them to, you know, discontinue, you know, cleaning services that are inside their homes, basically under the stay at home order. Again, enforcements can be very difficult uh, in the same way that Governor Inslee has sort of affirmed that they have very few enforcement mechanisms for their stay at home orders. Um, and so in the same way that the state is relying on people to choose to comply, you can put up signs and restrict access and shut down all of the remodeling jobs and tell people not to bring relatives and friends into the building. And you can, you can rely on people's willingness to comply because you have asked. But I think it would be a violation of the Fair Housing Act if you were to tell people they could not allow um, someone who might be coming to give care to them or comfort them uh, so you're not going to be able to keep friends and family out and you're not going to be able to keep anyone who's providing any kind of a, a service. Um, <clears throat> we've certainly seen people restrict, uh, you know, delivery people in the building. So require that if an owner has a delivery, they have to go meet the, the delivery person at the front door of the building, not allowing those people into the building. I think that's a reasonable rule unless the person is unable to leave their home. And that could be because you want them quarantined in their home because they are sick or might be. And if that's the case, then the board should look to try and find some way to get a volunteer or an employee or allow that particular delivery person to make the delivery to the door. So we have another question here uh, for you all. Are association managers considered essential? I'm going to answer that, even though I'm not an attorney. I think you are essential. <laughs> but let's hear from the attorneys. Can you go ahead? Well, I think that it is an essential service, um, partly because of the financial aspect of it. I think that you need to be receiving the income and posting it from the membership. You need to be paying the bills. But those are things that can largely be done remotely. Uh, in terms of serving the um, the customers or the clients as managers. Uh, most of that we're seeing our managers doing remotely. Some of them did it remotely before the crisis. Um, <clears throat> so, you know, I, I think most of the businesses are, have kind of as my office, very limited in office staff, mm -hmm. but enough to make sure that the mail is being picked up and that, uh, checks and bills are being received and that uh, invoices for services that are necessary like, you know, fire alarm monitoring and utilities are being paid and insurance are being paid. I think that, especially if you look at something like 
is the insurance bill being paid? Absolutely, that is essential. So yes, yeah. I, I would say managers are essential. On the other hand, if a manager doesn't want to go attend a meeting in person with their board, absolutely tell them you will attend by phone or by video conference. And uh, I've already you know, had this conversation with a couple managers. If a board member comes to me and says the manager didn't do their job because they didn't show up for a board meeting, I, my response is basically bullshit. They were doing their job responsibly. Yeah. Yeah. <clears throat> Okay, so we have another question. Statistics are beginning to show that there will be a huge increase in bankruptcy filings due to the inability of an owner to meet its financial obligations, either to the mortgage company or the association. Are you aware of any special protections for associations that can best protect funds due to them during such a process? Then uh, additionally, pandemic as a specific exclusion in most property policies, but would not um, the says, but would not the loss assessment writer inside, okay, but would the loss assessment writer inside their liability <laughs> policy cover such fiscal loss to the association, meeting assessments not being able to be paid, meaning assessments not being able to be paid? Uh. Well, the, uh, the question about the loss assessments, uh, that's, typically related to a property loss and the loss of income is not going to relate. And it's usually in the individual policy for the HO6 policy, meaning individual owners, not an association insurance policy. So I don't anticipate any loss assessment insurance to be triggered by the pandemic for the benefit of the HOA. For individuals, I think it's possible, but again, the loss assessments are usually very specific to property losses, which are not covered by the HOA's insurance, but would be covered under the individual policy. So I, I guess right now my thought would be there it's a, uh, um, an avenue of recovery which has no possible result. The question about bankruptcy it's always been the case that the bankruptcy might wipe out the personal debt, but does not wipe out the lien that the association has on the piece of property. And so even if someone does file bankruptcy and limits your ability to recover from the person, if there's equity in the real estate, then the association ultimately will still recover. Um, and we may see a repeat of what happened back in the you know, 2009, 2011 range where a lot of people were, were filing bankruptcy to eliminate these debts. Um, but a lot of those ended up going into foreclosure. If we do not have a significant drop in real estate values with the recession, which is going to, well, I don't know, which started last week, then we won't see a lot of major losses to HOAs. The problem back after the Great Recession of 2008 was a combination of homes which were foreclosed on with zero equity by the banks and the same owners declaring bankruptcy. So the two avenues of recovery which each HOA has were both shut off. And at least today, we're not expecting that in the Seattle area. Uh, the, the preliminary indications are that Seattle real estate prices have not taken a big hit yet, which is a little surprising to me. I thought that there might be an immediate uh, drop in values, but the, the reports I'm seeing are that real estate is still selling. The other thing to keep in mind, I think, is that even after the recession of the, you know, the latter half of the first decade of this century is that um, even after that, associations that were proactive in uh, creating and then sticking to collection policies and being proactive with individual delinquencies as they arose, uh, mostly those associations uh, were able to recover the assessments that were due to them. Um, I, in fact, I don't think it's overstating it to say that, well, what more than the majority were able to do that. It took longer and the association had to spend more money, for example, on legal fees in order to institute a foreclosure lawsuit. 
um, or to pay an attorney in a bankruptcy proceeding to do like a motion for relief from stay to get permission from the bankruptcy court to foreclose on the property in question. Um, but even uh, in the years following the recession in 2008, uh, the, the relative rate of collection over time, it just was a longer period of time, was still fairly high for associations. And I think what puts associations in the unique position um, that is better than most creditors uh, is that the association's debt is secured or the owner's debt to the association is secured by the property. Um, and foreclosures on their own may not always result in you know, money recovered simply by, by virtue of the foreclosure itself, but it opens up a number of other options once you go down that road. So certainly it's something that we would tell our clients to be cautious about right now. Um, as we mentioned before, working with your owners to the extent possible is our general recommendation. Uh, but don't, uh, if you if you are dealing with an owner who is unable to pay and has not communicated with the association about a plan to sort of fix that situation, um, don't don't make the mistake of waiting a year before you send it to your association council. Um, the sooner that a debt gets to your council, uh, the smaller it is when it gets to your to the lawyer for the association. Uh, the more likely they will be able to collect in full. The more likely the owner will be able to pay. Um, you know, if they get a lawyer letter when they owe $1,000 versus a lawyer letter when they owe five or seven or 10, you know, the chances of them being able to pay are very different in those scenarios. The other thing I'll point out is that under CAI's um, guidelines, which they put out this week on a moratorium against foreclosures, they also still say that associations should record liens against the property mm -hmm to make sure that their debts are going to be paid if the, the property changes hands. Yeah. You got anything else, Gil? Uh, I do, okay. Um, I do not um, have, I have a question. Questions. Go can, ahead. Can a, an association legally uh, provide an anonymous announcement to the HOA that there is a test positive amongst the community. So there's, uh, I would say legally you can do that. We would recommend against identifying the individual owner. Yeah, no, this would be totally anonymous. No owner, no unit, no floor, no, you know. We've had one client that did go so far as to identify the wing of the building so that the people who lived in that particular wing could assess their risk better. Um, we, we've had one client which has a confirmed case. Um, the owner who was sick for some reason didn't identify themselves as having had the disease until 11 days after they had tested positive, which seemed a little bit odd to us. And that community ended up adopting an emergency set of rules related specifically to people who had contracted the disease. And it was to basically say, you should not be walking your dog through the lobby. You should not be coming to pick up your mail. If you're gonna be quarantined, it really means quarantine. And they adopted rules that said, if you've, if you've contracted the disease, you need to uh, give your pets to a neighbor or family member so that the pets can take care of them while you are under quarantine, uh, that you should not be picking up your mail, you should not be doing anything else. Uh, but again, if they're sort of relying on the owner's willingness to follow those rules. And we did even set up the rules so that it says, how long after the, po or the positive test, the owner is supposed to stay quarantined and that is that they've been cleared by their doctor or the health department. And the, uh, this was in Snohomish County, the Snohomish County Health Department is saying that the person who tested positive should be wearing a mask when they go out for three days after they have tested as cleared from the disease. And so we basically adopted all that following guidelines established by the government uh, sort of presumptively makes the rules reasonable. And uh, 
they did an emergency meeting of their board, adopted it on a Friday evening, and posted all the rules around the building and emailed them to everybody uh, that evening. Thank you. All right. Okay. Well, we have one more question that just came through. Actually, Gil, while you're looking at that, I want to read Alicia's yeah. comment because I think it's helpful and, and provides hope to those that are worried about delinquencies right now. Mm -hmm. um, Alicia just commented that we just collected the last $40,000 that was owed by an owner from the 2007 crisis last summer. Just hold steady. Um, and, and I can for sure confirm just from the work that we do with our clients that um, you know, if you stay the course, follow your attorney's advice, um, you know, and be proactive with your delinquency. Sometimes it takes time, but judgments are good for 10 years too. So uh, that may not provide a whole lot of hope for this year's budget, but it doesn't mean that, that all hope is lost. Okay, so another question is, uh, does Condominium Law Group have a payment plan template? that can be drafted with recommended language, which, which applies to homeowners who are experiencing a financial hardship due to the COVID-19 crisis, that they can provide to their boards for review and consider a payment plan requested by a homeowner. So uh, we could prepare a template for an association, but um, some of the, part of the problem with templates, right, is that they are very, very generic. And because each association's processes and uh, collection policies are a little bit different, I'm not sure um, how confident I would be in an association's ability to execute uh, a payment plan such as this um, without at least a little guidance from the association's attorney. So um, we can certainly work on providing something that's generic, um, but we would always recommend an association have their attorney at least look at it and customize um, a payment plan for the specific association. We have done that for clients in the past unrelated to COVID-19, where a client's dealing with um, a, like a large special assessment or some other circumstance that uh, gives rise to the need for a, a number of payment plans. And they're trying to save the association and the homeowners the cost of sending each one of those delinquencies to the attorney. Uh, so it can certainly be done on an HOA or association by association basis, for sure. So you can email me if you have questions about something like that. Do I don't see any other questions in our group chat. Um, I guess um, one thing that we'd like to know, because we started our first Zoom conference uh, last week, um, I think 10 a.m. on Wednesdays works well for us. Um, did you want to see us have another Zoom conference? Because we're getting questions all the time, every every day. Um, can you just show a raise of hand? Or ra raise your hand if you're interested in maybe another Zoom conference next Wednesday at ten. Okay, all right. Ken, Valerie, is there anything else you'd like to say before we finish up? I'm good. I don't think so. I'll just say one more thing. Continue to wash your hands and don't touch your face. <laughs> 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 All right, everyone. Thank you so much. If you've got any questions, you can email info at condolaw.net. That comes to me and I can uh, distribute it within our firm. So thanks a lot. Stay healthy. Have a happy April Fool's. <laughs> thanks, everybody. Right. Thanks, everyone. Bye-bye.